Well, so, yes, I, uh, I used to run the, uh, uh, the Dean's Forum for a long time, and so I, many of your faces are familiar, and, and sometimes I forget names. I bumped into Mary Lusk the other day at the uh, bishop's office, and I, I, I was, it was a flood of memories, and so if we have the time, I hope that uh, we can get reacquainted, too, afterward. I'll talk here for a little while, and, Take some um, questions and then we'll leave a little time if any of you wanted these books uh, for Mother's Day or for any other occasion. Um, uh, let me give you a little bit about me for those of you who don't have any idea. I, uh, my name is Ian Punnett. I moved here in 2001. I was just, I had about a year left on uh, my seminary experience. Columbia Theological Seminary in Atlanta, where I knew Spencer Simmel. When I moved up here, um, I, I really was drawn to the Episcopal Church. I was drawn away from the Presbyterian Church, really on issues of sexuality. I, I just kind of wanted to be in a church that was um, and, and, you know, for better or for worse, it made that call and was sticking with it, and I respected that. And the Presbyterian Church was not doing uh, and I just thought this is really, I thought it was interesting and I liked the higher uh, sacramental life of the Episcopal Church. And so everything about it was a good fit for me. Um, I was uh, brought on to um, work with adult ed here and then eventually as I was in formation uh, with the church, um, I I took over the Dean's Forums and I did that for about two, two, two years. And just like when I was here, um, I always knew that God loved me when I could get a parking space uh, <laughs> at St. Mark's. So, not very often. God <laughs> sometimes doesn't love me. You know, but today, uh, it, it was nice to get here early enough to get a space on the first floor. So, um, but even while I was here, I had already begun, I had already begun to do uh, work on this book, uh, How to Pray When You're Pissed at God. The, the story of it is that when I was in seminary, I took, um, uh, I was in an Old Testament theology class with a, a fairly well-known, um, nationally respected, voluminously published uh, uh, professor named Dr. Walter Brueggemann. And Dr. Brueggemann um, made a comment once when we were talking about uh, the Psalms. And we were going through the categories of Psalms. And as you, many of you know, uh, you know, there's your praise Psalms, which are all about, oh God, you're so wonderful, and everything's so great, and it's perfect, and it's a perfect world, and you're the king of it. And then there are the kingly psalms, which are, oh, we are such a great king. And um, you, you know, this is a terrific kingdom, and you, you are such a great king. The, the world is filled with your royal splendor. And then there are other categories of psalms that, that, that get, you know, kind of debated amongst um, scholars to a point. Uh, one of the larger categories, in fact, the largest category of psalms, um, are, are the lament songs, which are that speak in a, from a different place about a relationship with God. As a subcategory of lament songs, uh, there's something called the curse songs, or deprecatory songs, as some people call it. And those songs are very angry indeed. Now, even the lament songs, I think, um, are often miscategorized. I mean, it's one thing to say, uh, I lament the day I'm having. Boy, what, this is a tough day. It's what a, this is really not going my way. Um, it's, it's another thing to say, God, why are you letting me have such a crummy day? Why have you emboldened my enemies? Why have you, why have you made it so that I can't have a good day? Um, to me, that crosses a line a little bit from just a lament about, I wish things were um, to kind of a more <coughs> a challenging position with the divine. And, 
and what Dr. Brueggemann said in, in that class that day stuck with me, and this would have been 1999 or something before I came here. Uh, and he, he said um, that these are some prayers by some pretty pissed off people. And if you really look at the cursed psalms and even many of the lament psalms, you see that flavor in there. So this is, there's a lot of a lot of anger is laced in these psalms. Um, it may not be the dominant theme, and maybe they end happily, or maybe there's another theme in there about praise, but the, the anger piece is, is not insignificant. So I, I was sort of struck by that, and I, it, it, it spoke to something that I had carried with me for many years, which was uh, the Poseidon Adventure. <laughs> Remember the Poseidon Adventure? Yeah. Remember? Remember the, Poseidon, the, the original movie? Uh, there's some distinct characteristics of the Poseidon Adventure. It's really the first disaster movie about this boat that gets turned upside down and, and the people that have to survive by climbing up to try to get out. Um, and and there is, you know, there's a star-studded cast of in this disaster genre, which also is establishes this, uh, um, this new vehicle for, for Hollywood. Uh, but there was also the fact that other than the some really terrible overacting, <laughs> <laughs> which if you haven't seen it lately, the, uh, the scene where uh, Shelley Winters dies, <laughs> this, this side of Daffy Duck being shot <laughs> it's so... <laughs> but that having said, there was a, there was also this this wonderful piece, this part that was written for Gene Hackman as the uh, renegade uh, a renegade minister, a guy who had been def sort of it was sort of ambiguous. He'd been sort of defrocked or something, but he was still he was on his way to serve as a missionary in Africa and. It, but he, he has this relationship with God, which can only be described, from, even from the beginning of the movie, as contentious. And as the plot developed, uh, Gene Hackman's character becomes increasingly uh, more angry with God. And that's a really unique feature of this movie, the Poseidon, if it ever pops on sometimes, sit down and watch it. And there are several key prayers that Gene Hackman's character offers to God during the course of the rescue. Uh, shaking his fist at God, calling God out on God's lack of support, um, or even more so, going out of his way to claim that God was trying to impede their success. And and I'd seen that movie when I was little, and I it, I always thought about it. And I always thought that is so interesting to me, and I never heard anybody pray like that. And I was a fairly devout kid, and, and it just really stuck with me. So when I Later on, when I heard Dr. Brooklyn make that connection about these are some prayers by some pretty pissed off people, I remember thinking about Gene Hackman, and then I started thinking about the number of people that I knew that when I told them I was going to seminary, talked about anger toward God. For one reason or another, whether they were because they were abused, whether it's because their life just wasn't working out the way they thought, or the way they were told it would. That if they go to church and they, you know, they follow this path and they walk that line, that good things will happen. And it says so right there in the Psalms, and it says so right there in the Bible, and 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 it also says it won't. But you know, churches don't often pray or preach from that standpoint. That hey, it may not. You know, we, we mostly take the positive tact. And so I, I started kind of playing with that idea a little bit about the. The need that many people may have to let go of anger through prayer, and whether or not there isn't a psychological component to these prayers, where after having expressed anger toward God, the people feel better for praying to them. Bottom line, they feel better, and you could almost see it in every one of the angriest songs is that they, there's a lot of things that are said. There's a lot of ways that people call out God. And then, at the end, there seems to be a reaffirmation of, thank you. 
So that praise piece comes at the very end. And, and I think that if we looked at that in normal human terms, it might be that the piece is just like we might, any of us might express it, which is, thanks for letting me get that off my chest. I had a lot of, I was doing some serious venting. Can I get you some coffee? You know, I mean, there was a sense of, of relief, of release. So I, I, I took that with me when I was doing work as a chaplain intern. And like a lot of people who are going through the coordination process, um, I, I, did, I did a rotation as a chaplain intern in Atlanta, and then I did one more when I came up here. I did it on my own up here at United in St. Paul. And this time, I, when I was doing them, I was becoming really, I was very focused on what is the role of angry prayer in that type of recovery? How could this help? So I started doing something actively to decode some of these very angry psalms. Uh, and that is when I would meet with somebody who is in a hospital room, uh, who was staring up at the ceiling or staring out the window, who is feeling contempt for family members or feeling great disappointment that why am I the one laying here when these people run around the street shooting people? How come I'm the one who gets cancer? How come I'm the one who's going through all these humiliations when, look who's, all the people in the news are politicians that are ripping off taxpayers or people who are in charge of, you know, corporations or whatever, and they felt, felt this just sense of great injustice. So, I had tried at various times to, to take psalms, the especially angry psalms, and read them with people while they, were, um, while they were going through their experiences. What I found was is that not everybody could relate to what was in the psalm because of the vocabulary. For example, Psalm 22, it starts like this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Uh, later in Psalm 22, the references <coughs> start to get a little more cloudy. <coughs> Many bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a pot sherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. Now, that is a... It's some wonderful poetry, but I think it's also fair to say that some of the there may have been a time when oh, like the bulls of Bashan, you know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> but unless you have an, an annotated Bible, and even if you did, it doesn't really speak to what people were experiencing. So fairly early on, I started to experiment with rewriting the Psalms. And I was rewriting the Psalms, taking very specific references that people had made in their, in our conversations, and, and putting those <coughs> into the Psalms. So I, I, sat, I rounded off all of the sharp edges, and then just on an individual basis, I just started swapping out vocabulary. Here's an example of how I rewrote Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? Why don't you hear my pain? God, I cry out to you by day. Nothing happens. By night, silence. My parents and my ancestors believed in you, and you helped them. I've heard the stories, so why not me? What did I do? My family has cried out to you and they were saved. Lots of people I know have trusted you, God, and you didn't let them down. 
So to you, I must be a worm and not a human, a non-human, to be scorned and despised by you as I am by others. Because it's not like my faith is helping my social standing either, God. It feels like everybody who sees me just mocks me. They hurl insults because I'm so pathetic. And they shake their heads saying, this idiot believes in God. Let God help. If God exists, let God prove it by helping this loser. But since the day I was born, I have been yours. You made me trust in you even while I was nursing. From my mother's womb, you've been my God. So now, when I need you the most, why are you so far away? You know what this feels like? God, it's like I'm being chased down the street by some psycho guy in a scary truck, determined to run me over Sweating and breathless and in fear for my life, I jump over a backyard fence to escape, only to discover that I'm now surrounded by starving, snarling pit bulls. I'm trapped. Bite by bite, God, life is killing me. I'm spent, and physically I'm so exhausted that all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax and melted away within me. God, I need to be refreshed so badly. I need a streak of things to go right. Imagine me as a clay flower pot that has been smashed on a hot, sunny patio. No matter how much water you pour on those broken pieces, that pot cannot hold water anymore. That's me. My soul is parched. My, stung, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Like that broken pot, I've been laid down for a dusty death, baking in the hot sun, useless. Imagine that, God. The pit bulls are getting closer, their bites are going deeper, and that psycho guy in the truck is driving around the block faster and faster, looking for me, and I've got nothing in reserve. The dogs have now pierced my hands and my feet, and it feels like there is no way out. I am wasting away from my wounds. And I know that people can tell. They stare and whisper to themselves as I pass on the street. And I'm sure some people think it's funny <coughs> that I deserve this somehow. So-called friends are already taking advantage of my weakness. They can't wait to get their hands on all my small treasures. Like jackals, they are licking their chops, waiting for me to drop so they can divide up what I have heard. So, Lord, O oh my strength, come quickly to help me, for I'm having trouble hanging on. Deliver me from this cutting pain, my precious life from the vicious power of that which is tearing me apart. Make me invisible to those who seek to hurt me. Make those who want to profit off my pain forget my name and where I live, and in exchange I will raise your name to my brothers and sisters, in the congregation, I will praise you. You who respect the power of the Lord, praise God. For God has heard the suffering of this afflicted one. God has not hidden from my cry for help. At least somebody has listened. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise God. May their hearts live forever. At the ends of the earth, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord in their pain, for God will listen. Even when my family and friends are sick of hearing about my problems, no matter where you are in the world, God will share in your pain. People will speak of God even on their deathbed, and generations will proclaim God's righteousness to a people not yet born. That's how cruel cool God is. So, I would start to read that for people in their hospital beds or sometimes on a, on a call, on a pastoral call. It's really interesting to see the reaction reading that version as opposed to the Psalm 22 that exists in our Bibles. Nothing wrong with that version. But when I would read this one, people would go like this. <laughs> I was reading. And the other thing I noticed is that one of the clues for me that people were experiencing anger toward God and feeling all bottled up, feeling like they couldn't pray.
way now, which they would say would end up with a title. And the same thing that Dr. Brooker did said in class one day. They would just say, I'm just so pissed at God. I don't know how to pray. I'm just so pissed at God, I don't know what to say. So I thought, well, there's something to that. And, uh, and so I, I, I fought for that title, um, How to Pray When You're Pissed at God. That's, my, that's the answer to when people say, I'm just so mad at God, I don't know what to say. And that's what my whole intent was. Of course, it's not always interpreted that way. <laughs> uh, even before the book was released, uh, I was banned from any mention. The book was banned. I bet you can see my name. Uh, the book was banned from uh, any mention on any of the hundreds of uh, evangelical talk stations owned by the same radio network. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll be honest with you. Um, there are worse things that can happen to an author than to get banned by somebody. <laughs> by an unpop, by, and, uh, but, and I'll say this for them, they did it really nicely. <laughs> It was not mean at all, and it was not. It did. It never. It, ne it wasn't ad hominem. They didn't come after me. They just said we're uncomfortable with that word, and I get that. I get that. Um, and they're not alone. But to not use that word would have been, in my opinion, doing a disservice to the people that were really in pain. To to back off of that word. For a marketing position, a better marketing position, perhaps, um, I thought would have been kind of the cheesy way out. So we stayed with it, even though, believe me, it got debated. I mean, this book's published by Random House, Harmony Books. Um, they don't have a lot of books with that word in the title. <laughs> they was a first for Random uh, House. And they, they, they're kind of a conservative publishing company, too. They're not, uh, they don't go out of their way to create controversy. Um, but that was part of, only part of the experience, too. The other part of, of praying when you're angry is that you may not be angry with God. But you may be so angry that you stop praying anyway because you're so angry with somebody else. And there's a lot of anger toward parents, things that happen as you are being raised. Intentionally, unintentionally, things that don't get processed. There's a lot of marital anger. There's some anger over any number of things. The loss of a child. Um, feeling disrespected in one's whole life. Even if it's not by God, it's just a sort of a horizontal disrespect that people feel from others around them. And it builds up over time. And when people stop praying, they stop going to church doesn't work, synagogue or whatever. And I spend a lot of time actually with a rabbi from St. Louis Park who talks about uh, human to divine anger um, in Judaism. But we also address it in Islam. But the but the key, that other key part, and it's the subtitle for the book, How to Pray When You're Pissed at God, or anyone else for that matter, is that there is a lot in the Bible <coughs> about being mad at other people. And that's really kind of a curious thing because, you know, we, we pray a lot, we sing the Psalms, but we don't sing all of them. And, <laughs> and you won't often hear Psalm 109 sung by a choir. Here's part of Psalm 109. Uh, don't be silent, O oh God, of my praise. For wicked and deceitful mouths are open against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They beset me with words of hate and attack me with cause. In return for my love, they accuse me. And even while I make a prayer for them, they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. They say, appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand on his right when he is tried. Let him be found guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few. May another seize his position. May his children be orphans and his wife a widow. May his children <coughs> wander about and beg. May they be driven out of the ruins they inhabit. 
May the creditor seize all that he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his toil. May there be no one there to do him a kindness, nor anyone to pity his orphaned children. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. May the iniquity of his father be remembered before the Lord. Do not let the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually. May his memory be cut off from the earth, for he did not remember to show kindness, but pursued the poor and the needy and the brokenhearted to their death. He loved to curse. Let curses come upon him. He did not like the way you get the idea. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of anger in that psalm. Anger both at the lies that are being said. This person is experiencing things that are said to them that are, that's, that are deceitful. And then also the anger that's flowing back toward those people. And, and God is being called to help. Right this wrong. Right this shit. And that's another way in which this is often lived out. Now, there are, there's a kind of a third component to this. So we have the human to divine anger, and then also the human to human anger. But another thing we try to uh, try to process a little bit in the book is is God to human anger. And this piece is very interesting because um, you know, as I mentioned, there's sort of a vocabulary issue for um, the, uh, the book. A lot of people get mad about the, the P word. Um, there's, a, there's an irony to that, in that many of the folks who complain about the title um, may be more evangelical, they may be more conservative in their religious outlook, and many of them uh, might be inclined to read more from the King James Version of the Bible where the word pisseth appears regularly. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's the F that is the, uh, the saving syllable in that. Um, but yeah, the, there's a term, there's a, there's a, a term in Hebrew, um, it's sort of an artful term for men, uh, those who pisseth against the wall. <laughs> Kind of a long way, to, kind of a long way to say guy, but but it's in there, and it's actually the Hebrew word for word. That's the Hebrew. Now there, there are many things in the King James version of the Bible that um, that are not well translated from the original Hebrew or Greek. That is our scholarship today on Hebrew and Greek is at a much higher level than it was when that was originally done in early 17th century, right? So you have, um, you, but that's one, actually, that's exactly it, word for word, what the Hebrew says. Today, we don't. Today, most Bibles round that out, and they just say men. It's funny how, you know, even a, good, a really solid translation, uh, you know, any of the ones you'll find, the NRV or anything, they, they don't use that term. Uh, but the, the original Bible does. Um, we can say the same thing too about um, about the, about other words. Jeremiah three, uh, God uses a very particular Hebrew verb, uh, and there's a lot of verbs that Jeremiah, which you know, in, in the prophetic tradition, when a prophet speaks, it is God's word. So the prophet isn't. Paraphrasing God, the prophet's voice is the voice of God, right onto the paper. So in this case, we are led to believe this is exactly what God says. And God uses the, the Hebrew verb shagal, as in like the painter. Uh, and shagal um, is the closest verb. In fact, some would say it is exactly the same verb that we would use for the F word. Um, and God uses it in anger. God is very angry in Jeremiah 3. And in fact, the reference says that God is mad at, at Israel and refers to Israel as God does occasionally through the voice of prophets um, as, an un, as somebody who's an unfaithful spouse. And says that, uh, that, that here is Israel shagaling 
with anybody that she meets. And she'll shagal anybody, anytime, anywhere. On the side of the road, Israel shagals with any passing God that happens to go. That's how unfaithful Israel is. It, there's a lot of words. There's a lot of other Hebrew verbs that <coughs> Jeremiah could have used um, to express that. I mean, you can say it. You could have said laid down with. It doesn't say that. Um, the, uh, the, the lexicon, the Hebrew lexicon, the Hebrew to English lexicon, makes a point to note that it is a vulgar term used for a violent sexual act. But it's not violent in terms of rape. <coughs> um, again, we are to see that as being that she's pouncing on these other people as they're going past. Um, but there's a point to that. Uh, for the same reason, too, that we have uh, several references by Paul, um, who uses some, some fairly salty language as well. Um, Paul makes a uh, reference in Galatians 5.13, for example. Um, Paul talks about, he's very mad about all of the, the, the re-Judaizers, the re as they're called. Um, they, these would have been other uh, these would have been other evangelists who were on a mission and where, whereas Paul had told all of these uh, Jewish communities that you could become Jewish Christians you could start, you could be Jewish and follow in Christ and that would be great but he also told Gentiles the same thing, you too can follow Christ without becoming Jewish, you don't have to be circumcised and um, that the groups that would follow behind would say, oh, no, 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 you gotta be, you got to be circumcised. So this starts this debate, right? We see this as, as nothing new. We, we read this sort of thing all the time from the pulpit. But in this case, uh, Paul's getting pretty frustrated with it in Galatians. He actually says, I wish those guys who were telling you that would just go ahead and slice off their own members. <laughs> he, he didn't mean ours. <laughs> um, and the same thing's true when it's used later on of the word skubalon, uh, a Greek word meaning shit. Now it gets sometimes interpreted as rubbish, but there's a very there's a very different word for rubbish. If you wanted to use rubbish, there's tons of other words, but very specific word. It, it, um. At very least, we can translate it as crap. Um, but you could just as easily make an argument. For this. And Paul's mad. He just, I, I consider all these things to be crap. Just so the reason I bring that up is to say the other thing that you should always feel good about, and part of the permission of this book, my aim, is that pray what you're thinking, say what you want, use the words that occur to you. Don't try to sound like you're writing the Bible. <laughs> if you think those thoughts, and we believe in an omniscient God, who are we fooling anyway? Right? If you're thinking them, God's hearing them, might as well say them. If that's what you're thinking, don't try to shine on God. I, I just, there's no point to it. And, I, and then the other way is, the other way to look at it is so important is that you will feel better for having said it exactly the way you want to say it. That in itself is therapeutic. If you waste a lot of time thinking, oh, I better say this in case God's listening, well, you've added a step that doesn't really exist. God is listening, but God's listening to our hearts. So start there and do it so that you start to feel better. Because that's the whole point of praying and learning to pray when you're pissed at God. Now, many of you will not have this emotion. You don't suffer from this, and I hope you never do. Uh, but you may know somebody who does. And, and it, is a, it is kind of a one-stop shop book for the whole discussion about angry prayer. Um, it's very, it's, a, it's written casually. 
Um, it's not a it's not a, a deeply theological book. I make my points simply, I hope, and excessively. That's the point. Um, and it, it's going well enough right now that I'm I was just saying I'm, I think I'm in the top twenty still on a couple of lists on uh, on Amazon. Uh, I was the last time I. Um, I will be on uh, CBS Morning News coming up this Friday, unless they change their mind. Unless they sort of look at the book and go, whoa. But I mean, book me, I book my flight book, I'm going. Um, and, uh, and so that'll be interesting. And there's a lot of people, I mean, Huffington Post, um, Huffington Post and Glenn Beck's The Blaze both did pieces on uh, Esquire.com and Thomas Nelson Publishers. Uh, one of their main bloggers, Thomas Nelson is one of the biggest, most conservative publishing companies in the United States. They publish nationally, they publish a lot of Bibles and a lot of Baptist literature. They wrote a very nice review. So from the left or the right, it doesn't matter. In fact, it's my experience, it's more common that the people that are experiencing sort of crushing reevaluation tend to come from the right. Um, but all of that was just to say that there's something about this book which makes it a good gift.